All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to January 2016's Telehealth. I am Emily from um, the uh, Parkinson's Resource Center in Spokane, Washington. So hello. Um, today we have a presentation on Gentiva uh, Home Health and Hospice, and we have two speakers here today, which is Amy and Jessica. Um, and if we haven't muted our mics yet, go ahead and mute the mics until the very end, and then we'll do all the questions um, at the very end. And let me read a little thing about um, Amy and Jessica. Amy is the manager of clinical practice at Gentiva Hospice in Liberty Lake, Washington. And Jessica is a hospice spe specialist with Gentiva Hospice also. And here you guys go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're very happy to be here. And so we, we have a, a lot to talk about. And I think what's important um, to know is um, those of you here that are in the audience, certainly I don't mind if you ask questions um, during. Sometimes we might want to slow down or, or write them uh, to talk about at the end. What we want to do is, is give you just more information about what the Medicare hospice benefit is, what some of the, the barriers to receiving care um, maybe, um, and to increase uh, your, your understanding either as a patient or as a healthcare provider um, on how to help transition someone um, to hospice. What we know is that um, uh, nationwide, only about a, you know, less than a third of the people who might be eligible to receive hospice um, actually do receive that um, benefit. And so we want to be able to just make you more aware of um, um, what the, the hospice benefit is for, for patients and families as um, we hope that it is less of a specialty, you know, in the long run, like everybody should have um, hospice at the very end of their life. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So um, some of the barriers to, to receiving good hospice care are that people don't want to talk about death. We're very much a death-denying uh, culture. It's very taboo in most families and, and social circum situations to talk about death. Um, and so that's certainly... Um, a barrier, um, and then we look toward our healthcare providers to be able to have this conversation with us. You know, we don't necessarily want to bring it up when the doctor knows it's time. He'll bring it up with us. You know, that's a really paternalistic view of medicine that many still hold. Um, and in reality, a lot of healthcare providers are very uncomfortable talking about it as well. So we have, you know, two groups of people who maybe need to be talking about this who who aren't uh, for a variety of reasons, usually because of uh, the way they were grew up and kind of just the culture that we have. And that's that's all changing actually pretty pretty rapidly. There are a lot of um, initiatives uh, going on to help change that. Ooh, pretty fast. Sorry. Um, so, um, no, there we go. I guess I got it. You're reading. Um, um, so who, who is eligible for Medicare hospice and, you know, what is that? Um, um, you know, healthcare professionals, we have an obligation to educate patients and families about their choices, especially what may be, um, an option to them, um, either at the end of their life or as they move through different healthcare systems. For example, um, not in a hospice setting, you know, our, we rely upon our doctor to let us know, hey, it might be time to operate on, um, on that knee, you know, and then you're eligible to receive some hospital care, usually some rehabilitation, you know, at a nursing center. All of that is, is covered, at least partially, um, by Medicare, you know, so it's important that we all are aware of what programs uh, Medicare is able to offer. And um, it's, you know, in my opinion, that hospice is one of the best Medicare programs that's out there uh, because it is 100 percent um, covered, you know, no co-pays uh, like there are with many other uh, types of Medicare programs. Um, so transitioning from more of a rehabilitation focused program to a hospice program is not always just about changing service providers. It's also a shift in philosophy um, about care and kind of what your understanding of your illness is and what that means uh, to you and your family. Um, and patient and family expectations are, are very much um, a part of hospice differently so than in other healthcare arenas. Um, the family or the primary caregiver is considered to be a unit of care and, and receives bereavement care following the death of the patient and a lot of preparatory work um, along uh, while the patient is on services to help kind of um, come to terms with um, the fact that, you know, someone that you love very much is not going to be with you much longer. 
okay. Um, so uh, many of you may or may not know some of the highlights of the Medicare hospice benefit. Um, it is um, designed uh, to be for people who have a life expectancy of six months or less. Um, you, it's part of the Medicare Part A benefit, which is also the hospital or nursing home you know, rehab type of insurance. Um, a patient signs on to hospice, elects to have their Medicare hospice benefit, stating, I agree that I would like to have my care managed by this hospice team for um, this terminal disease process that I have, that should it run its normal course, best guess is that I have six months or less um, to live. In all reality, people end up living a lot longer or a lot shorter than that. None of us have a real crystal ball, and uh, prognostication is not an exact science, but we, you know, we, we live within some, some guidelines that Medicare sets forth. And then, of course, you must be, receive hospice from a Medicare-certified program. Here in Spokane County, there are three Medicare-certified hospice programs. We have three excellent hospice providers here. Um, in Spokane and all of the communities that are out there uh, watching, um, I'm sure have uh, hospice providers in your in your community as well. Uh, I know some of the sites, you know, Pullman, Colfax, Gentiva does uh, service. Um, so we can also help find a provider. You know, any hospice should be able to help point you in the right direction um, to find a provider should you need it. So let's go back to a little bit about this um, physician judgment. And um, uh, it, it's important to know that um, not every patient presents the same, you know. Not everybody gets from point A to point B uh, the exact same way. And certainly is true of people with complex medical conditions. We've all heard of people who, you know, were had a uh, very poor prognosis, say, with cancer, and they they beat it. You know, they, they ended up living a lot longer. You have some people who were expected to improve and then... Uh, did not and declined really rapidly. So it, you know, what we try to do is take a general set of um, guidelines for disease-specific uh, symptoms and and criteria, um, and and fit people sort of into those boxes, knowing very well that everybody is an individual and it doesn't always follow that same course because. Although you, you are admitted to hospice for one particular disease process, a person very well may have a lot of other disease processes that are all contributing to that. And that's actually where hospice is changing right now. The industry of hospice is changing, so it's less about one thing that you're dying of, say, and more about you know what is the, the broad spectrum of a patient's illness and how is all of that contributing um, to the uh, decline of the patient. So. I always like to say it's like the knee bone connected to the leg bone, connected to the hip bone. I mean, everything's sort of related um, in one way or another when a person's uh, body ultimately starts um, starts to fail. And we all will. I like to uh, talk to, a, I present to nursing students uh, in Lewiston, actually, uh, about every semester. And that was that's one of the things that we talk about. You know, what is the, the current uh, death rate for humans in the world? Does anybody know? It's 100%. You know, none of us, none of us are going to, to going to escape this. You know, although it's something that you know more, we, we don't feel comfortable talking about. So hopefully, you'll leave feeling maybe a little bit more empowered to talk about it. So, um, especially for healthcare providers, and I think as well for consumers, because our healthcare industry is becoming more and more consumer driven. Um, you need to know, you need to prepare yourself so that you have the tools um, to ask questions of your provider who may not bring it up because they don't want to offend you, you know, by bringing something up to you, you know. So um, we can help providers. We, we provide tools um, to help them determine whether a patient may or may not qualify for hospice. There are some really general um, rules of thumb related to um, you know, weight loss, you know, unintentional uh, steady weight loss, overall um, increase in the amount of hours of somebody sleeping, overall um, decline in functional status, say, where somebody was up, walking around and walking around the neighborhood you know, a year ago to now in bed most of the time. You know, there are a lot of different things that, depending on the person, may signal that they may be in their last you know, six months to, to a year of, of life. And that's sort of the, the guideline that we give to medical professionals. Um, if you wouldn't be surprised if this patient if you were to see their obituary, you know, within a year, you know, if you're not, if you wouldn't be surprised that that might happen, um, now it would be the time to start talking about hospice because it doesn't mean that they necessarily qualify for hospice right now, but they need to be prepared with what options they have to help support themselves and their family um, in those final stages of life. 
Um, so this is a pretty busy slide, and we do have some with lots of lots of words on them, so we can certainly get people copies if they if they really want. Um, but I'm going to have uh, Jessica, I think, talk a little bit about some of the common myths, kind of myths and facts um, about hospice, because there are a lot of myths out there. It's still kind of the H word um, in in some circles. Yeah, definitely the H word. <laughs> Um, a lot of people will mistake hospice with palliative care and kind of vice versa. And hospice really is about taking care of the pain. And so that's kind of like the goal of the palliative programs that you will hear about out there is pain control and symptom management. But um, some of the myths that we think about um, that you have to be in the last stages of dying, uh, you know, the last couple of days, and that's so not the truth. Um, when Amy was talking about six months or less, kind of that crystal ball of could you be here six months, a year, you know, kind of somewhere in there, it's time to start talking about it because when I speak to my families, um, I always tell them that when we come in, we can kind of help put out the little fires along the way instead of that big inferno at the very, very end. And our team comes along, your team, to support that patient and the family. So we'd love to come in sooner than later because we don't want you to be ready to die and gone in three days. Um, it just doesn't work as well at that point um, for all those emotional and um, physical needs um, to include everything that does come into the home um, when someone does go on hospice. Um, we don't force you to give up all your treatments. We encourage you to kind of help us decide what you want to see at that point um, in terms of what medications do you want? Are they really going to be effective for what your treatment goals are? We're not going to expect you to not um, take care of a urinary tract infection. We're going we're gonna to help you fix that with antibiotics. So we don't pull everything from you. Uh, you can have um, a DNR or we can have um, any sort of combination thereof, um, what's commonly known as a POLST, the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, our nurses will sit down with you and speak to you about what those options are and help you make an educated decision. Uh, when someone has uh, a request for CPR, it's not always in the best um, what do I want to say? It's not always in the best interest of that patient because of the nature of CPR, of the nature of running them back to the hospital. And when you're on hospice, you're supposed to be kept comfortable in your home, uh, whatever you call home. So we try to educate on that. Um, you can go to the hospital. You can revoke your hospice services. Hospice is not forever. Uh, but when you want to make that decision of going back to the hospital, we can help you we can help educate you on what that may look like and help remind you of what your goals once were when you came on service with us. Um, we do pay for, at times, physical therapy, so we can still help with home health. Um, if it's for a palliative nature. We wanna make sure that your caregivers aren't going to hurt themselves trying to transfer you. Um, so we don't necessarily pull all therapies, but we do sit down at the time when we talk about an admission and we tailor your, um, what I'd like to say, hospice experience to you. What are your goals? How can we help you live comfortably in your home? Um, I've actually seen people on hospice for way longer than six months, so it's not six months and you're cut off. Um, it's six months as long as you still meet those Medicare guidelines um, and we're, we're able to show a steady decline in your um, disease process. Uh, we provide more than medical services. We provide equipment in your home. We provide medications that's related to your disease process. Um, we have bath aids. We have chaplains. Um, so we bring a team to your home in order to support you in your end-of-life wishes. Um, your attending physician can be um, your current primary care physician or it depends on the conversation. You can elect to have our medical director or you can stay on. We can let them know about um, 
what's going on with you. So there's a couple different options. So you don't just lose your doctor immediately right away. I think it's really important is the relationships that you, that you have with other medical providers. That's sometimes, I think, the biggest barrier to people not wanting to come onto hospice. They think that means that I'm never able to see my doctor again. And that's certainly not, not the case. Um, I think more largely, doctors, general practitioners, certainly some specialists, don't feel comfortable with where the patient may be at in their disease process. They, they feel like they're no longer the one who should be managing all of the care and request the assistance from hospice. And so sometimes it's important that we just open up those conversations so that the patient doesn't feel like the doctor that they've known for, for 20 years is no longer involved in their care. Um, so there are a lot of different options. Other, alternatively, people oftentimes when they come to hospice, they've been unable to get to their doctor of recent, and it's been really hard for them to make, you know, uh, annual or even, you know, more frequent appointments. And so some really appreciate the fact that we have our own doctor who can come see them in their home and help manage some things that they maybe would call their doctor's office and not get a call back from three days, you know, for three days on an issue or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of flexibility um, in that way. There is. And two, when you're on hospice, you, you have access to us 24 hours a day, so we can we can actually get back to you quicker sometimes than your primary care physician can. I would say usually. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, uh, this is a slide more for you know just helping to encourage healthcare providers that they really are you know play a key role in identifying when patients may be at um, proper time points. Um, to, to have that conversation about hospice and then maybe make a referral to hospice. I mean, ideally, all of you, you know, we wouldn't need hospice for years. The point is that you have, the seed is planted now so that you would know what to expect and what would be available down the road. So these are some common um, diagnoses for hospice. Um, it used to be that like 70% of all hospice cases nationwide were cancers. Um, more and more and more um, cancers becoming treatable or people are living longer with that. And so we're seeing a lot more other chronic illnesses um, be uh, more popular uh, hospice diagnoses, especially um, dementia. You know, Alzheimer's type of dementia is, is becoming a public health crisis. You know, we're certainly um, seeing more and more people living with that disease. Um, ALS, you know, residual effects from stroke, COPD, CHF, some Parkinson's. I mean, there are a lot of different um, disease processes that ultimately end people up um, with the support of hospice. So these are certainly the most um, common ones. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is just an example of some um, criteria. We won't go into it, but you know, the example for a patient who has uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or emphysema, something like that, um, they usually have to have a, uh, to be considered for hospice, a, what we call a bed to chair existence, meaning that you know they're dyspneic um, with with walking very far, and so they're really um, you know living primarily in their wheelchair, to or you know, taking very short steps you know throughout their house. They've had increasing hospitalizations, usually for pneumonia or other types of um, you know respiratory failure reasons that they've gone into um, the hospital. Um, their oxygenation is 88% or less um, on room air. Um, so there, you know, these are things that just help. Um, certainly, because you may f meet some of those things, doesn't necessarily make you eligible for hospice. So that's just very general um, criteria um, for that. So um, the next slide is a, you know, an example of a of a patient um, who short of breath uh, on exertion, requiring assistance, you know, for all of her activities of daily living, has had. Um, three ER visits, two of them resulting in hospitalization, probably with IV antibiotics and other treatment for, um, for pneumonia. Um, and this patient, Mrs. Uh, S, is probably saying, you know, I just, I just want to stay home. You know, if I have a hard time breathing, I don't want to have to call 911 and go to the hospital. I want to be managed here. And that's what hospice helps do is anticipate what the common symptoms are for patients who are in a, uh, entering uh, the end of their life. And I, and I don't even want to say end of life like it's tomorrow. You know, like there are really common symptoms that occur as a patient is in the later stages of any disease. And so what we like to try to do is help equip that patient and their family to be able to manage that as best they can in their own home. You know, usually with the use of, um, you know, medications to help with breathing or, or pain. You know, we're really um, kind of experts when it comes to pain and symptom management. And I think treat patients a bit more aggressively 
using these comforts, like aggressive comfort that we're trying to do in a way, um, more so than other doctors might feel comfortable with. We hear that a lot. Oh, finally, you know, mom, somebody, you know, somebody prescribed her some medication for pain. You know, the doctor didn't want to do that before. So. So as I was talking about earlier, the team that may come to your home, wherever you choose to live, um, we have a nurse that would come to you at least weekly, uh, more so as you decline or need our services. The medical social worker comes and helps you um, work through family problems. We may have um, someone that, you know, the family is really upset about certain things. They kind of come in and help you work through that. They can also help you find other services in the community that you may not know about. Uh, the counseling services um, can be provided by spiritual coordinators who can also kind of work with the rest of the team to help you through whatever crisis is going on. And then we also have the medical director. Again, the hospice aide. There are volunteers uh, with hospice, and um, they can do a multitude of things as long as it's not patient care. So they can't help you walk to the bathroom, but they can help your wife you know, watch over you while, she, you know, she goes to the store. So little things like that that they can come in and do, sit with you, read to you, uh, sing to you. Uh, again, the PT therapies are available. Prescription medications, supplies, medical equipment, and oxygen is, is all part of that Medicare benefit. So that is some of the benefit of, of hospice is that it is – it's financially advantageous for a lot of families who, you know, maybe were paying 20% for um, the, their Part B to pick up the wheelchair or other types of equipment, you know, drug costs, things like that. Um, so that's that's all covered under hospice. And again, as I kind of alluded earlier, that the industry of hospice is changing a little bit. When we look at a patient, not necessarily for what their diagnosis might be, but their overall big picture. Part of the, the some regulations that came out was that hospice. Uh, um, covers medications, all you know, pain medications, antidepressants, anti-nausea medications, laxatives. That one time, you know, we may not have covered. We would have said, no, that's related to this disease process and not not this other. So things are getting a bit more. It's pretty all inclusive, I guess. Mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think what's really important too is, again, that anticipation of need. Um, so that things don't get to a crisis point. Um, you know, having a chaplain come in and talk about not necessarily uh, religious things, unless you are, in which case that could be where the conversation goes, but talking about, you know, how are you with with your life, you know? Thinking more existentially as far as, you know, are you, are you well with the world? You know, are there things that are complete or maybe not complete? You know, are there relationships in your life that, um, maybe need some mending. You know, this is also a, a great time of, um, of closure and healing. We want to normalize the fact that, you know, dying, dying is a normal part of living. And what can we do to help pe make people feel at most um, you know, at ease uh, with what's um, going on? You know, it should be a very normal time where you have the right to choose where you want to be, you know, at your own home and your living room with surrounded by people or Maybe no. Maybe you want to be a, a, in, a, in a hospital or institution so that people don't have to care for you. It's it's important, and I think people, consumers of, of medicine, haven't always been thinking like that. You know, as far as oh, it, it is my choice about what I want to do because that's what what hospice is all about, and hopefully where some you know medicine is is going to is what does the patient and family want? You know, what are their goals, and how can we help meet those um, through the variety of services that we're able to offer. Um, I think it's 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 really neat that it doesn't have to be so medicalized about your disease and condition and medications. Once that gets sort of settled, that's that's nice because then you're able to you know transcend and, and discuss more about um, forgiveness and relationships and all of those things that are really the most important in your life. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there are some other. There's different levels of care um, in hospice, and just so briefly, we'll go over um, that there is respite care available. So um, a caregiver might just be exhausted, you know, and need to take some, get some, a good couple nights of sleep. So we, we do have contracts with different inpatient um, uh, settings here in the area, um, such that a patient can go up to five nights um, 
uh, to give their caregiver a break. That we've used that before. Um, you know, unfortunately, like a patient's daughter fell and broke her ankle. You know, so she needed some some help this short term, and so she could uh, make some arrangements at home and, and do some things. So that's that's a unique thing that's covered um, by hospice, the Medicare benefit. Also, general inpatient care. So we talk a lot about people wanting to stay at home and comfortable and, and supported. Sometimes um, their disease is such that. Uh, symptoms might be really um, might flare up, and they may need more than what we can do at home. And so we do have contracts to have people go into an inpatient setting, usually short term, to help get maybe some IV pain medication started and titrated, so that you can go home with a line and be comfortable, or um, other types of um, sedation. It, it's more um, uh, more unusual, but at the same time, it's there. You know, so it's not a matter of you having to go off of or sort of sign off of hospice or something to be able to seek a little bit more aggressive care. Just again, depends on what the goals of care are. Um, and then also, you know, counseling services, and I think more specifically bereavement care, 13 months following the death of the patient, that family or surviving caregiver, whoever that might be, um, has assistance through the hospice program for support groups, mailings, phone calls, visits, um, you know, connections with, um, with somebody to help normalize grief. I think that's another little taboo thing we have in our culture is, yeah, you know, most people, they get three days off work and then, okay, it's it's over. Uh, it was their time and it's you're ready to, you know, move on with your life. And that's really not how grief works. <laughs> that's not how it works for any of us. And so um, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't understand how normal and okay it is um, to, to feel that that loss, the love that you had for that person, you know, ongoing. We, you know, we can help be that that ear when the rest of your friends or other uh, people in your life may not um, have the patience or understanding uh, to walk with you on that grief journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had mentioned earlier that hospice isn't permanent. Uh, we can, Gentiva has hospice and home health. So if you were to actually improve on our services and not qualify for the hospice Medicare benefit anymore, we can actually help you transition back to a home health and you can pursue therapies that way. So, and you can, um, you can elect to come off a of hospice at any time uh, if you want to pursue more curative treatments. Um, I think I told... I told someone else this today. I've actually known someone who was on hospice for seven years. Now, that's really not the norm, but very exceptional. Um, yeah. very exceptional. She was actually on it for adult failure to thrive, which meant she just wasn't eating a lot, wasn't moving around a lot, and she graduated. Um, Gentiva, I see we graduate people all the time because they don't qualify for services, and so that's really exciting. A lot of people who get onto hospice actually do better because they're getting all sorts of love and attention and do well. And so we, we graduate you. You get another birthday. You get another day to, to try your best to get better again if you if you elect to. So um, there's really no limit to how long you can receive those hospice benefits as long as you qualify under Medicare's guidelines. And that sometimes is what, a little bit trickier. Graduation mm -hmm. is a nice way to call it. We discharge people if they have an extended prognosis is what that technically um, means. It means that you've we don't have a crystal ball. Everything that we could tell when you when you came onto service, you had a, a less than six month prognosis. Sometimes just uh, cutting back on the polypharmacy and getting people, you know, maybe mending some of those relationships in your life kind of gives people a new lease on life. Not everybody, mm -hmm. but it does happen. And so that's kind of exciting. Um, when when hospice can can do that, and again, what what it means as far as no limit is that you could be on hospice for you know a year, be discharged because you really are no longer medically eligible, um, go on to receive other treatments or just kind of live along, and then you can re-enter the hospice program. So there's not a, like a cap for Medicare on how many days um, you receive. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more about you know the meat of um, you know talking about dying and and grief. Um, it's it, we talked a little bit about how it's kind of culturally unacceptable uh, or it traditionally has been to talk about um, death and and some of the the emotions that go with that. You know um, the in, the anticipation of losing someone that you love is. 
um, oftentimes, you know, unbearable because um, you, you can see what's going to happen and that's where having that additional layer of support from hospice, from our social workers and, and chaplains and a lot of trained volunteers and can be helpful just to have someone um, to talk with and also to help focus on how we can make life for you and your loved one, um, you know, the patient as good as it can be. You know, we talked about using therapies and different services. It's all focused on the patient's quality, you know, of life, um, you know, maintaining um, freedom from pain and um, being as functional as long as you can be. I think that's also really difficult for a patient as well as you you're grieving the person that you maybe once were, you know, that you were maybe a, a marathon runner or something, and now you don't have enough breath to, you know, even walk down the hall, you know, to the bathroom. You know, how can we help, um, you know, still give you, you know, some, some purpose and some um, enjoyment um, in your life when you are, you know, facing all of these losses? Um, some people, again, um, we may have to help just sort of normalize um, that we, again, don't have a crystal ball and we don't know how long someone's going to be. You know, you think some, some families are, are suffering because they just think, gosh, my loved one has just gone on too long. You know, when is this, when is this going to be over? You know, and, and then that makes them feel guilty because, gosh, why would you ever want to try to end somebody's life sooner? You know, that's not the intention that they had, you know. But we know that feelings are very complex, you know, that you can have, and that's grief for you. You, know, you can have simultaneous um, you know, relief and guilt and uh, sadness, you know, all um, at the same time. So, um, you know, again, for, for healthcare um, workers, and, and there is more and more focus on this. Um, we saw, Jessica and I both went mm -hmm. to see um, Dr. Ira Bayak. He was sponsored by um, Providence to, to come and speak here at Eastern Washington University with an excellent presentation. He talked a little bit about how doctors really uh, receive like no training in how to have conversations with people, how to be um, kind and you know realistic and and you know the meat of things. You know, so um, he mentioned that there was a lot of focus. I thought this was interesting on. Um, you know, birthing and maternity and how that's such a subspecialty um, anymore, OBGYN, and, you know, let's reduce the 300 hours of uh, mandated hours for medical residents for obstetrics and just take 30 of those hours even, or maybe a third, that would be great, and have them focus on being with those who are dying, you know, helping with that other very normal um, uh, process that is human. The, the birth and, and the death, so. Well, and the doctors aren't, they're not geared, they're not trained to talk about it. They're geared to fix things. And so sometimes the physicians will feel like they have failed the patient or the family if uh, someone is dying and they can't cure them. So we're trying to get out there and encourage the, the physicians to start having those conversations sooner so that the public is educated about what hospice does and what it really is. Um, so that their patients can have the right care at the right time. Um, let's skip that one. Do you want to talk about pain control here? Mm -hmm. okay. I want to emphasize again that hospice is looking at the whole person. And uh, I have a little diagram that I should have included in here. If you look kind of like a like a pie chart, you know, with different quarters, um, medicine's very focused usually on the physical component, and that's oftentimes what overshadows other very important components of a person. Um, you, you don't only have just your physical pain and, and symptoms. You know, you have you know psychosocial, spiritual, emotional spheres. You know, this all you can feel pain in different. It's not just physical pain. Sometimes you can feel. You know, there's definitely such a thing as emotional pain or spiritual pain, and that's where um, hospice is very unique and able to help meet you where you are and address what um, type of pain or um, issue you're having, and not just you know so medically focused on um, nausea or pain. Although you know, it's like the, I like to liken it to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you kind of you need your shelter and you need your your pain and maybe these other things 
taken care of first before you can transcend to talk about you know some of those those other higher level things like the meaning of life you know, for example um, and that's again one of the benefits of being on hospice longer is that we're able to get to know you a little bit better we're able to help manage those maybe acute pain and other symptom um, issues so that you can have some time to focus on what's important with your family or with your emotions or um, all of those other things um, other things that are, you know, stressful, of course, is the financial. We talked a little bit about how the hospice Medicare benefit is so inclusive with medications, medical equipment. You may end up, you know, diapers, you know, adult diapers, uh, catheter supplies, all of those sorts of things are, are all included. And so um, it, it's, it ends up being very helpful mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, so... As patients, we would encourage you to bring up hospice to your doctor. Um, this slide's a little bit more about healthcare providers talking to you, but you you have a drive there when you're in the office too to ask questions about your healthcare and what your goals are at you know whatever stage you're at. Um, I would encourage you to bring it up to your doctor and just ask some questions of, of how they feel about it, when they think that it would be the right time for you to talk about hospice. Um, so don't be afraid to, to spearhead that conversation um, and to be your own advocate because as, as a doctor may put you on one medicine and you heard a different one is better, speak about hospice too because you're, you're in charge of that conversation. Hopefully, if you get the amount of time that you want in the office, we know it's, it's very short. But we want you to be able to talk about your fears and um, your expectations with your doctor, too. Yeah. And that goes not only for hospice, but other advanced care planning. And I think that's um, something that's really big and, and more and more going to be uh, reimbursable by Medicare. You know, so we're, we're seeing that shift just here in the next um, well, just passed legislation, and we'll see how it unfolds in the next year. I know there's been a lot of clinics, Providence, uh, for example, I know has um, embedded within their own system, you know, advanced care planning, um, medical assistants who are trained in that. You know, Rockford's looking to do something like that. Group Health has something, you know, similar. Mm -hmm. So it's hopefully going to become more and more commonplace that you might get asked at the doctor's office about these things. So uh, what we're coming from is a traditional background where, oftentimes opportunities are missed, either due to time constraints or, or again, that feeling of being uncomfortable having that conversation. Well, I guess the, the bottom line is, is that when we, when we look at your hospice Medicare benefit, um, there's a lot of benefits that come with that. But what we're really here is for the quality of the end of your life over the quantity. Um, and so we, we seek to come in and help you in all those areas that Amy was talking in that pie, the social, spiritual, physical, emotional, um, and really try to give you a quality, quality end of your few days or your lot of days, whatever, whatever may come of that. Um, so we're, we're definitely looking for quality. Maybe I was doing something. So unless you have anything else, I think we'll open it up for some questions. Yeah, we could go. We could go on for hours about this. So that so that's kind of the purpose of this too. Is we've we've presented you with some very basic um, information. Much of it you've probably already heard, and this is maybe a, a bit of a refresher. So what we want to be able to do is answer any questions that you might have that this could have spurred, or or anything that maybe we didn't cover because you know with time restraints, of course. Um, there's so much more that we could uh, talk about, individual cases, et cetera. So is there anybody here in this room that has a question? Yes. You can use the mic. Okay. Oh, we're the last. I'm so sorry. Okay, so now we are going to, I am going to go down the list and um, say the city name. We'll do roll call, and if you have any questions, go ahead and tell me how many people um, are there, and then if you have any questions, go ahead and ask the questions um, at that time. So let me start with Anchorage, Anchorage, Alaska. Go ahead and unmute your mic. I'm just going to 
keep going. So if I miss you, go ahead and tell me at the end. Um, Billings, Montana. Oh, thank you. One person, no questions. One person, okay. Thank you very much. And, and was that Alaska, right? That was Billings? That was out of Billings. That was Billings. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now we're going to Clarkson. Is there anyone in Clarkston today? I can see him. Five people, no questions. Five people, no questions. Okay, thank you very much. And then we'll go to Coeur d'Alene. There were three of us here and no questions. Three, okay, thank you very much. And then we'll go to Colfax. Nobody. And then Cawville. No. Okay, how about Kalispell, Montana? No questions. No questions? Okay. How about Miles City? Miles City up in Montana. Okay. Let's go to Moses Lake. Hi. We have 14 people and we have a question. Just Hello. one moment. Okay. We have 14 here, but we've had upwards of 24 people today. So we've had a good turnout. Um, my question, first of all, very good um, presentation, very informative. One aspect of hospice uh, benefits that I was not aware of was respite care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, curious, uh, what I wrote down here was short-term care for up to five consecutive nights for temporary break for a caregiver. I uh, wonder if, um, based on some first-hand experience these ladies have had with that, if they could expand on that a little bit uh, more. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. That's a great question. The question was about the, the Medicare hospice respite benefit. I think it is really, it's less commonly used than one would think. And I, and I think a lot of it has to do with caregivers being, and family members being so tenacious and wanting to, to care for their own patient and their own home so badly that they oftentimes won't let <laughs> their loved one go into a care facility. But I, I think it can be a couple different things. It can be an urgent or a planned thing. So um, we have contracts with several different nursing homes here in Spokane, and I know in our Pullman office we have uh, um, places there too. Hospice of Spokane, of course, has their own hospice house that they can put people um, into. And so um, it's, it's either planned, so it's identified that maybe a caregiver is going to be going to a, um, a wedding in Oregon in two months. And they know that uh, rather than hire somebody 24-7 or have other family come and be with the patient at home, they can actually pre-plan to have the patient placed um, into a, a nursing facility. It has to be a Medicare-licensed um, facility, so it's usually nursing homes or you know, skilled nursing facilities, although we're just using the, the nursing uh, facility part of it, not the skilled um, and so we can pre-plan and have orders set ahead of time with medical equipment, uh, medications, all of that are already sent and, and ordered. And sometimes we've had families then opt to pay privately for, say, another five to ten days so that they get a full vacation or break or whatever the case may be. Um, and again, that could be for a planned vacation. Maybe it's for a surgery. We've had this happen too, where you know, the patient is on hospice for dementia, say. The caregiving husband, you know, of course, is running himself ragged, caring for his wife, um, ends up having some kind of heart issue, needs to have a planned surgery. Sometimes we've had a, a patient and their um, their spouse be at the nursing home together <laughs> for a couple of days, uh, just depending on, on what happens. So um, it's, a, it's a Medicare required benefit um, under hospice. So in order to be Medicare certified as a hospice, you have to offer four levels of hospice care. 
the, the most common is routine care, which is what we do every day in and out at, at patients' homes or assisted livings. The second level is respite care, which we've talked about. The third level is inpatient care, like in a hospital. And the, the last one is called a crisis care, where depending on how, um, how sick you are and, and medications needing to be titrated, we can actually have a nurse be in the home sometimes eight or more hours in a day. Um, as a general rule, um, um, nurses are not live in or you know aren't in the home 24/7. Uh, although we're available 24/7, so uh, uh, again the respite is covered <laughs> under uh, Medicare. It, it's just um, usually the hospice, uh, you know, is we just pass the reimbursement that we'd get from Medicare for that day to the nursing facility. Is sort of how that works. So, any other questions about that in Moses Lake? And I could. Are we still yes, on here? Yeah. Uh, Follow-up question that I just asked. I, I was envisioning that uh, it wouldn't be the rest of the care for the patient would not have to be in a, an approved facility. It couldn't be in the home such as it's being done. Uh, that's what I was envisioning. Uh, well, is it, that it, an impossibility? It's, so it's not it's something that's... It's, it's so the respite care actually occurring in the patient's home, say for a 24-hour period, is not something that's covered under the Medicare hospice benefit. However, um, our social worker, for example, assists with helping families hire caregivers. Oftentimes, there are community programs such as elder services that offer 20 hours of respite per month. Volunteers are a source of respite for hospice patients. So, you know, although volunteers can't administer medications or, you know, uh, shower a patient, they're able to be there one on one with the patient so that the, the primary caregiver is able to take a nap, go take a walk, go shopping, and kind of have them be a phone call away or a nurse a phone call away. So, we've sort of done some informal respite too um, in the patient's home, you know, recognizing that. Uh, a husband, you know, the, the son and daughter caregiver, it's their anniversary and they want to go out to dinner and a movie. We, we might schedule one of our hospice aides to come and, and be with the patient and then have a volunteer come and then maybe have an aide come back and a nurse or, you know, we, I think we're, we try to really work with families on making sure that they can get some of the time away that they may need because that, that role of a primary caregiver can be very, very taxing um, to people. Um, you've probably heard maybe of Alzheimer's and the 36-hour day. You know, it's, it's sort of similar when you're you're caring for someone day in and, and day out. It can be, again, just very taxing. So, did that help answer your question there? Thank you. There may be one or two others here that have a follow-up question in that, ring, that same area. Is that the okay. case? Sandy. No problem. Uh, I guess we're good to go. Thank you very much. Okay. And I think um, Emily here would be able to, um, uh, you know, get you our contact information if you do have follow-up questions via email or, or whichever. You know, I think that's what's so cool, I guess I'll say, about the Medicare hospice benefit. It should be the same no matter where you live. You know, the, the hospice that you receive in Spokane, of course, we think is exceptional. You should be able to receive that same exceptional care from another hospice provider wherever you are. Very good questions. Thank you. Thank you, Moses Lake. Um, let's move on to um, Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, two here and no questions. No questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Let's go to Port uh, Townsend. Did I say that right? At Jefferson Healthcare? No. Okay. Let's go to Pullman. There are five of us here, and we have no questions. No questions? Okay, thank you for coming and listening. Let's go to Richland. No? Okay. And then Sandpoint, Idaho, at Bonner General Hospital. Is that Sandpoint? 
Oh, okay. Okay. Um, to ask it. Hi, we have three people. Okay. And no questions. No questions. Okay, thank you very much. And then, uh, Walla Walla. No one. Okay, and then last but not least, let's go to, did I miss anyone before I go to Spokane? I see Tanaska, but. Oh, that was three, okay. Let's go to Spokane. Is there any questions here in Spokane? We got some, okay, let me grab the The question was, is it hard not to qualify for hospice? Um, I, I don't, I think yes and no. <laughs> I think it's a hard one to, to uh, answer. Certainly, um, it's easy to qualify if you have an a, a incurable illness and have had a trajectory of decline, multiple hospitalizations, and are no longer seeking curative treatment. Um, those are all things that make a patient eligible for hospice. We do, unfortunately, I think, unfortunately, because of course we want everybody to have these benefits, we do have to say, no, we don't quite think it's your time yet for hospice to a large number of people who do seek hospice services. And that's okay in a way. I think a lot of families come to us just wondering, do they qualify? Because that might help claim, you know, frame their um, next steps. You know, oh, is it now time for hospice versus, hmm, they don't quite qualify. What's going to be my next plan of action for caregiving, treatment, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, sure. I would hope not. I know that it, hospice, uh, the Medicare hospice benefit, the, the question was with the current you know, political climate and uh, our economic status here in the United States. Uh, Will Medicare hospice go away? I think I think not. I think that when we talk about accountable care organizations and, and using Medicare dollars wisely, um, hospice has proven to be a good cost benefit um, as far as healthcare savings because we're catching people with a with a common goal of, of not having unnecessary treatment. I think my personal opinion is that in, in our nation what's bankrupting things is a lot of unnecessary treatment, a, a treatment that is applied to people who will never receive benefit from it, that we're just kind of trying, knowing that it will fail, but we want to do something. You know, So I think that with that energy, we could use it to do other somethings um, that would promote more comfort, quality of life, and maybe you know better respite for caregivers and uh, you know mending of family relationships. That's what I would hope. Hey, the question is, is our local Gentiva Hospice medical director a, a palliative care specialist? Our, our local medical director here in uh, Spokane and our Pullman site is Dr. Eric Sohn. So he is a certified hospice, he's a certified hospice medical director. He actually missed being able to be grandfathered in for the hospice and palliative care specialty. So now um, to be a fellow of uh, hospice and palliative medicine, you actually have to go to somewhere and, and a participate in a fellowship program. And there's currently not a program like that here in Spokane. So he would have to, you know, leave his family and go, you know, somewhere like Los Angeles for um, a determined amount of time. So. Uh, Yes, he has, has definitely hospice and, and palliative care experience and training, uh, but no, we can't put the special letters behind his, his name at this time.
True. Okay, so the question was, uh, what facilities do we have contracts with for respite care, and what do we do to ensure a smooth transition? Um, I don't think I'll go into detail on what facilities we have contracts with, because we have we have many, and most facilities we're able to get a one-time contract with, so that's the other thing, is some we have multi-level contracts with, and some, you know, our corporation and their corporation can't meet on the legal language, so they just want to do it a one-time thing, so that's pretty easy to get set up as well. So. Usually we anticipate, one, can the patient be transported in their own private vehicle or um, do they need wheelchair or, or AMR, like a stretcher type transport? So we determine what that's going to look like. And then we try to make everything that's at home sort of be the same as in that respite facility. So if they have a hospital bed and a recliner and a commode and a wheelchair at home, well, and oxygen, say, we make sure that our medical supplier delivers that into the to the nursing facility, depending on what the nursing facility already provides. It just depends on the facility. Um, and so that that equipment's there when they arrive, that the facility has all of the medication and treatment orders that they need for that patient and the medications for five days, or actually six, you know, always give a little buffer, um, have been delivered. Um, we have a, a nurse usually come and check in, you know, kind of uh, tuck in that patient and, and care coordinate. Oftentimes it's nice to have the patient's um, aide or volunteer who are familiar with them at home also go and help be part of that um, transition. And so we, we usually keep our same visit frequency, but depending on the patient and if their family is going to be visiting them there or if the family is going to be out of town, we may provide a little bit of extra companionship um, there at the facility. Sometimes it's nice, especially for our hospice aides who seem to get to know the patient the best um, out of all of our care team, um, to write up a little summary about the patient. Mrs. Jones um, likes to have her toast just this way, you know, and this is how she likes to have her routine, you know, so that we're able to help coordinate care. Those are all things that would be expected um, of the hospice um, when helping place um, a patient, even if it is short term. So the, the question was, how long does it take to qualify a person for hospice? And so I think sometimes a uh, 15 minutes, you know, I think depending on uh, the, on the patient, I think that you sometimes you can look at, I could look at a patient's H&P, you know, of what, what's going on with them. You can look at a patient, I think, sometimes, and it speaks so much more just by, I don't know, they, you can just sometimes tell by looking at a patient whether or not um, they qualify because you, you're looking at their functional status, you're looking at their mentation, you're looking at possibly their weight, of course, corroborated with the evidence that you might have in the medical record. Sometimes it takes us days to qualify a patient for hospice because we may not have everything that we need. We may have a patient who is pretty bright and alert and maybe hasn't had a lot of weight loss and we're waiting for records from Deaconess about their hospitalization. We're waiting, waiting for some records from their cardiologist about their ejection fraction from their last echocardiogram. You know, so there are I think sometimes the biggest holdup to admit a patient to hospice is making sure that we can say that they medically qualify based upon records that we're receiving. Um, the, the, there had been a question earlier about, you know, will with this current uh, economic climate, you know, will the Medicare hospice benefit continue? And, and part of it is we're, we're being more heavily regulated now than ever before because Medicare is spending so much more on hospice than they used to because we're helping give people the benefit of hospice, which kind of triggers a ding, 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 you know, we need to make sure that everything's just so. So I think a lot of hospices, including our own, uh, and maybe other hospices more so, because I feel like we've always been pretty pretty strict um, on our admission uh, criteria. Um, some hospices who've had patients on for years and years and years now are, are discharging them or, um, you know, maybe scrutinizing a little bit more. Because, you know, of course, we want to provide the service, but we have to be able to be reimbursed for that too. And that's what happens is if we if we don't have a patient who's well qualified at the beginning with supporting evidence, um, then Medicare will just say, sorry, you don't get paid. So we, we do a lot of that too. <laughs> I mean, not, not getting paid and that's okay uh, to, to a certain extent, but Okay, good question. So Medicaid, 